looking at the blinky lights. All right, there it goes. It's blinking blue, so we're good. Jason's, Jason. Jason's here to make sure that I don't screw up. <laughs> yeah. But I am going to watch it to make sure you get more than three minutes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Welcome back to the Goatee PFE two-session world tour at PowerShell Summit. So this time we're going to talk about group policy. And this, and contrary to all the other sessions at this event, this has nothing to do with DSC. All right, so we're going to talk about a few things that have been around for a long time that I'm hoping you already know, and a few things that are kind of brand new that you may have not seen yet. So these are going to be uh, some good things about managing PowerShell in the enterprise with group policy. So I want to use remoting across the whole place but I've got to turn it on first and I'm not going to walk to a thousand machines and type enable PS remoting dash force right so I got to do that with PowerShell hopefully you've been down the remoting path already but we're going to talk about some other little tips and tricks in here that I think you're going to find handy so I've been doing scripting um, over half my adult life that would make me sound less than 30 wouldn't it yes um, I know I've not really been half of my adult life. But anyway, a long time. Everything I can remember anyway has all been about scripting since my Commodore VIC-20 in 1982. Well, you didn't have an XD sorcery? No. So here's what I'm going to talk about. What do I need to know for managing uh, my environment with PowerShell and Group Policy? What are the requirements? We're going to talk about execution policy and remoting. Those are the ones that have been around for the longest. But then we're going to get into some new stuff with logging. And we're going to go into the logs and see how you actually find this stuff that's turned on by group policy. We're going to talk about update help, uh, login scripts, and invoke GP update. How many have heard of invoke GP update? Does anybody know about that? Okay, half the room. Good. That's good. We're getting the word out. Okay, so first off, uh, requirements. There is a about topic, about underscore group policy settings. How many have read that about topic? PowerShell. Oh wow, nobody. Okay. So if you just um, go in and type get help and then like star group policy, you'll find all kinds of topics in there. I'll show you in just a second. So anyway, uh, at bare bones minimum, you've got to have Windows 7 2008 R2. I think that should be kind of plain to see nowadays. Uh, we're not going to support anything older than that with these policy options. If you want the latest and greatest, you're going to have to run either WMF5 when it releases, or right now there's a special roll-up back in November, KB3850. How many have deployed that already? Anybody undeploy that one? There were a few hitches, I think, with certain things that we had to do in that KB. But anyway, it's a really good KB. It fixes up a bunch of stuff in DSC version 4 and adds a bunch of new features to it. So you get a taste, like a, a little preview taste of some of the WMF5 stuff in V4 using that KB. So I highly recommend that KB. And these group policies are in the location under administrative templates, either user or computer side. You're looking under Windows Components and Windows PowerShell. And as always, the computer side of the policy is going to override the user side of the policy. So uh, these are the policy settings. And the check marks represent everything that's default. So if you just install the OS by itself out of the box, you're going to get uh, these group policy settings that are allowed. Uh, however, if you install WMF4, WMF5, then you'll be able to leverage those new features. Notice WMF5 has a little asterisk here because uh, we've said that the next preview coming out soon will be available down level, but it's not actually official yet. So uh, you should be able to use WMF5 to get all these new features at some point in your existing Windows 7 environment. Okay. So we're going to go through now, look at uh, script execution, module logging, the update help, the script block logging, and transcription. So uh, PowerShell helps those that help themselves. You type get help group policy, you're going to find a bunch of topics out there that will tell you most of what you need to know to implement these things. 
the one weak spot there is the one on remoting and group policy uh, about remote troubleshooting tells you about half of what you need to be able to deploy remoting uh, settings correctly in your environment with group policy so uh, it'll get you most of the way there so let's talk about execution policy real quick again I know this is kind of basic hopefully you've done this already but you can set execution policy across the environment with group policy and that is going to show up when you do a get execution policy dash list you'll see user and machine policy here listed right at the top so you can see if it's been set locally in the registry on the machine versus if it's been set uh, through group policy and uh, the only thing you can't set it to is restricted you can set all signed remote signed unrestricted but you can't like completely force it to block policy that execution that's kind of interesting is that because it's restricted by default it's restricted by default I've got a another slide here we'll, we'll look at but uh, let me take a look on my VM here for 8.1 this is my Windows 8.1 VM and if I type uh, get dash execution policy that's funny. No. <laughs> it's no. <laughs> nice. All right. Let's let's load them up. Uh, let's load up another one here. Get dash execution policy. Remote sign. There we go. That's what I was expecting. Dash list. And you can see I've got. Wow. All kinds of policies going on here. So, <clears throat> use machine and user, and then local machine. There's remote sign. Yep. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. So um, next is update help. So in version 3 of PowerShell, we had this really funny trick where we shipped you PowerShell without the help in it. You had to run update help as an admin to get your help files. But then the problem was you couldn't get help files unless you had an internet connection. And there was this you know, hokey workaround, right? So now in v4 of PowerShell, you can specify a network location for your non-internet connected machines to download their help content. And this shouldn't be a big deal. You don't have to deploy the help content to every machine in the place. It's really just for people that are authoring scripts. Those are really the only people that need it. Most of the time they're going to have an internet connection anyway. But what you can do is you can set this policy here for update help and then you can check it in the registry to see the path where it's actually pointing to get the updated help and let's take a look at that policy if I go over to my domain controller here and I look at group policy I'll zoom in here so here's my group policy for PowerShell settings and we are looking for not that piece let's scroll down right here <coughs> there we go here it is so set the default source path for update help I've got it set to uh, share on my domain controller here called update help so this little process uh, looks like this uh, in my on my server what I need to do is, is run a few commands to, to do the save help let me zoom that in for you so first thing I need to do is create a new folder where I want to store that help and then create it share out that folder give everyone read access to it and then I run save help and give it that destination path and then it copies all those files into that folder it goes and downloads you'll see some XML and CAB files where it downloads all the how many have done this already All right, good most of you all right so this is how you can stage it up and this is all then deployable through group policy across the whole place. So if you don't want every machine in the company running out to the internet to update help, you can just pop it out on a share, push out this policy, and everybody should be good. So in this case, um, I've got a folder here with my updatable help. And you can see, for example, here's the Windows search. And it's got a cab and an XML file. And if you need any help about how to create those kind of help files for your own things, I think June's here this week. You can talk to June. And she's got a help session today or tomorrow. You can go watch as well. 
Next is logging, and this is where I want to spend most of the time. How many have done the module logging? Anybody try that? That's been out for a while. Okay, not many of you. The new two items here are the script block logging and the transcription. And this is what I really wanted to get into because this is the this is the cool stuff. Now uh, we've got the same policy location. This one's called turn on module logging. You can use wildcards to set up multiple modules. You know whatever modules uh, you want. Um, when you look at the properties of a module, have you ever learned get module and then pipe it to FL Store and look at all the properties of a module? Well, there's a little property there called log pipeline execution details. That sounds fancy. What does that really do? Well, we're going to take a look here in a second. You end up with an event 4103 in your PowerShell log that shows you what you ran. What's the command that you ran from that module? Uh, but be careful, don't set this to, to log every single module on the system. That, that will tax your system because now it's going to log everything that's running in PowerShell from there. You kind of want to watch that. Um, also, uh, this KB3850, I'm kind of like an evangelist for this KB because people don't know about it. It's an optional KB and it's going to fix a lot of your DSC stuff in V4. Go install this KB. Just know that if you do, um, some people have blogged about an issue where this KB uh, breaks a few commands, like the piping things to more or something. There's a few items there. I haven't been able to repro it, but a few people have had an issue with it. Uh, but that's with the module logging. And I'm going <laughs> to demo this here in just a second. Next is script block logging. Now, this is the new one that came out with that KB. And it also comes with WMF5. If you go download the WMF5 and look at the release notes, it talks about this in there. So this actually logs every command in the event log that was run on the box. So this is where, and Lee's upstairs talking about the same thing right now. Uh, but it's really cool. And this turns out to be event 4104 in the same operational event log. And then if you turn on the start stop invocation, that's 4105 and 4106. And that gives you a little bit more detail, including the run space ID, which uh, Lee was talking about yesterday, that helps you identify who actually ran that command. So you know the command, the run space ID will help you find who did it. And obviously the disclaimer with any logging of any kind is to be careful that you don't flood your logs, because these are going to be kind of high, high volume. And then the other one that we've just added in WMF5 in this KB, which is a roll-up from November, is the transcription. So how many of you start transcript in PowerShell? Okay, hopefully everybody. So you type start transcript, you give it a file path. Well, in V5, what we've done is we've amped that up now. So you can have nested transcripts. Remember, it wouldn't even work in the ISC. You only had to do it in the console. and There was no way to really do everything to capture everything on the machine. Now you can actually have a transcript file that captures all the PowerShell transcripts on the whole machine. Obviously this is around auditing and security and forensics, things like that, so you can know who's doing what on your machines. So that's a big deal. So um, that bypass the little trick hackers have been doing where they're launching not so much scripts but direct commands typed into the console to still track that, wouldn't it? It'll the still command track still that. Execute, but you've got evidence of what happened to that machine. Right. Nice. Yep. yep. And so, and when you set this policy, it must be an existing folder path. And I'm going to show you how I handle that in just a second. There's a couple different ways, obviously. You could use preferences or login script to create a folder path. And that's where your transcripts are going to go. Um, it, it's going to default to my documents. Boy, that's a great way to freak out your users. Um, this, these files start filling up their my documents, right? Um, but really, we're talking more about servers. You could do this for users, but you're not going to get that much. Usually for servers is really what we're talking about here. And because this is a security thing, you probably want to limit access to that folder. You probably want to put some special ACL on it that hides it, makes it difficult to get to for the bad guys so that they can't go erase their tracks, essentially. And then don't forget to automate the file cleanup. 
Uh, I used to have in my profile for my console a transcript. So every time I fire up the blue window, it's going to transcript everything that I do. So it gives me a, a way to, if I remember it, need to go back and grab something, I can. But I, after a while of doing that, I remember one day I was running a backup on my laptop and it, and it just like stopped at about 63% for a half an hour. Like, what in the world is that? And I went and looked into my transcripts folder and it had like thousands of 1K files, text files. <laughs> All right. That's not cool, okay? You want to put something in there to clean these up later, right? So make sure that you, if you're going to turn on this transcription, that you clean it up as well because it's, nobody's going to do that for you. You've got to clean it up yourself. All right. So let's take a look at some logging options then. In my, my big group policy object for everything PowerShell here, uh, this is really handy. One of these days I'll put this on my blog so everybody can get a copy of the HTM output so you can just get like a handy reference. Here's all the settings you can configure for PowerShell uh, in a policy. And let me zoom in just so we can kind of cruise through this real quick. So if we kind of roll down the list, here's our logon script. It's actually, it's a startup script for the computer. We're going to look at it in just a second. So that's one way we can leverage PowerShell and group policy. Under our security settings here, we've got WinRM turned on for remoting. We're going to get to that in a minute. And there's more for the firewalls uh, with remoting. Let's uh, keep going here. And we'll get down to the right here is what I wanted to see. So turn on module logging and you give it the module names. In this case, I choose star get, so it's going to do PowerShell get, it's going to do one get, it's going to, then I put the DNS client in there, just as an example. You can just put star for the whole list, and it'll log everything uh, to the event logs. Then we've got turn on PowerShell script block logging, which shows enabled, and then uh, right below there, there's include invocation headers, which is currently disabled. That's the the 4105 and 4106 events when you're starting and stopping a session. And then finally we've got uh, script execution which we've talked about already. So let's take a look at what these uh, events look like then on a machine. This is kind of fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a command and see if we can find it in the logs. Okay, that, that's really what this comes down to. I want to put a command on the system and then see if I can find everywhere that it was logged. And that's where it's going to get interesting. So I'm going to pull up a separate PowerShell window here. Notice I've already typed get execution policy. At this time <laughs> I'm going to do resolve dash DNS name. Anybody use this commandlet? NS lookup for PowerShell? Okay, resolve DNS names in the DNS client module where we turned on module logging. So now let's see if we can catch it. We're going to look for www. Dot, what should we look for? Uh, Redbubble.com. Redbubble is where you can buy the unicorn stickers. Okay, the flaming uni the fire breathing unicorn with the ninja kitty and the flag. Right. Go to Redbubble.com. You can order your own hats, t-shirts, mugs, all that kind of goofy stuff. Uh, laptop stickers. All right, so we just did a command resolve DNS name redbubble.com. So now let's see if we can find that in the log. <coughs> we are, all right, rewind for just a second. Three years ago, somebody just typed a command on a server. We have no idea what they typed. We're going to change all that right now. So let's take a look. Um, if I go down into the event logs, I'm under here in the PowerShell <coughs> operational log. So that's under Microsoft, Windows, come down to PowerShell, Operational, and I'm going to refresh this view here. And yes, we're going to do this with get one event here in just a second. I just want to show you the GUI for the people that need the comfort level of the GUI real quick. All right. So here we are. We've stopped and started some commands, and we're looking for executing the command prompt. You'll see that a lot executing pipeline let's see what we've got here there it is hey check this out nice. so there's your pipeline execution we did whoops let's uh, scroll through the output here there it is it says I did a resolve DS name commandlet with a parameter of name 
www.redbubble.com. So it actually shows me the commandlet and the parameters that were run. I've got the date time stamp, everything right there on the box so I can see. And that's because it was in that module DNS client that I told it to log for module logging. So that shows up right there in the log. Uh, we should find another 4103 event with the same command. Uh, let's see if we can find that one. It might take us a little bit longer. I'm sorry, 4104. Yeah, let's see. Uh, the problem with the 4104 is it's very noisy. Because if you think about everything that goes on behind the scenes when you run a command in PowerShell, there's a lot of other module foo that happens with, especially like the these DNS commandlets that are based on CDXML and they're actually calling a module that's running all this code in the background. So the problem with the 4104 events is there's a lot of log noise. So what I'm going to do is filter through some of that noise with some scripting. So let's uh, go over here and take a look. In my handy dandy ISE, uh, first off, I've got a helper function here. All right, who has beef with event logs in Windows PowerShell? All right, I, I know some of you, you know, this should be like every hand in the air, right? Uh, XML was not meant for people like me. I just, it's, it's not normal, it's not natural to be born and know how to read XML, right? So. Uh, I wrote a blog post a couple years ago. It's gotten really popular about, it's called XML Madness or something like that with Get Win Event. It's one of my most popular blog posts. And what I did was I said, you know what, when you get into a, an event log uh, entry, there's all these um, down in the body of the message, you've got these little placeholders like percent one, percent two, and they mean different things and different events. Different events have different schemas and they put different messages in there and different variables in there. So that all stores in an XML event data payload because there's no other really good way to do it. You have to have this dynamic schema for logging certain types of data in events. So XML is the best way to do that but it just makes life ugly for the rest of us trying to actually read the event logs from a script and pull out that one piece of data in the message body of the event. So what I did was I wrote a helper function that essentially dives into the XML piece of the event um, and it looks at dot event, dot event data, dot data, dot, in this case dot count, but it's dot event data, dot data and in there, uh, there is a name, and then this lovely XML thing, hashtag text, is actually a property name, which you must enclose in quotes to actually reference the property name so it doesn't comment out the rest of the line in your code. So anyway, I did all the, the legwork for you. I call this my magic inefficient XML event machine uh, because what it does is it actually goes through every event that you return and then it goes through all those XML properties and appends them with an add member to the object. So it creates a new property of that event with the XML property name and value. So it turns it into a more something that you can dump into a spreadsheet a little easier. And it makes it more friendly to work with when you're scripting. Uh, so anyway, that's out on the blog. You can grab that later. Just search for GoTPFE and you'll find it. All right, next then, uh, I'm going to to take a look at my modules here and look at the pipeline execution details. And what I want you to notice is that in this module list, whenever it decides to return, boy, my ISC is just playing tricks on me today. Let's just run it over here. So, when you look at your list of modules, there's a log pipeline execution details property. And that property on the DNS client module here is not set. It is set to false. However, we have defined that in policy to, mo to monitor that module. 
you can't see the effect of the policy here. You have to look at it in the registry key for the policy to see where it's actually turned on. If I were to manually come into the module and set that to true, then it would start logging that event as well for that module. Instead, I have to go look in the registry. What is going on with my ISC? All right, this is going to be fun. So let's, uh, let's go back here. And we'll run it out here. So here we can see in the registry then uh, that we have the DNS client and star get. Those were the settings that we actually specified in the policy for the modules that we wanted to log. All right. So let's get some, some data out of this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call uh, get win event. And then I'm actually going to pass that in to get win event XML that's going to format it all into nice little readable properties for me. And then I'm going to take those properties like context info and payload, pull those properties out, and send that out to my favorite command line out grid view. So here, when I look at this, here's resolve DNS name. It was run on 421 at 318 p.m. I think this uh, VM's on a different time zone. So there it is. I can see that I ran uh, resolve DNS name right there. And there are the parameters and the payload. So that's the module logging event, 4103. Uh, a couple other ways we can look at these. Uh, get one event here with the filter hash table. And go back. What is going on? Why are these not returning any results? ISE. Boy. <clears throat> this is interesting. So let's paste that over here. Oh, that's the wrong thing to paste. <laughs> I, the problem is I had a really good session yesterday with no issues, so. Except for the reporting problem. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's get on down to script block logging. So this is where it gets more interesting. So the module logging you've already got now in V4 of PowerShell. Now what we're going to do is take this another step farther. This is the stuff Lee's been uh, excited about with the deeper logging of every detail now in the PowerShell session. So here, what we're going to look at is event uh, 4104 and get a list of everything that's run. I'm just going to relaunch my ISE because this is uh, this is not good. we got to do this. I'm gonna, and I'm going to run it as an admin just for a little extra brute force. Now let's go open up my script again and let's try it now. All right. So here's my 4104 events. And what I want you to notice in these events is that there's a ton of extra stuff in here. Um, when I run something in the the console, here's the get dash serialize command. Now I'm not only capturing the commands that I run, I'm capturing the commands that the engine in PowerShell runs behind the scenes to make everything else happen. So this creates a lot of noise and makes it harder to find what I'm really after when I'm looking for the bad guys in the logs. Uh, so what I want to do then, uh, let's scroll down here and let's just look for the last 10 as a table here. Oh, I gotta redeclare my function. One second. All right. So what you get is this creating script block text. Notice it says one of one. Uh, if the message payload is larger than a certain kilobyte threshold, I don't remember what it is exactly, it's going to span that command across multiple event log entries. So let's dive in a little deeper then. So here's the actual script block text. So notice what it's showing us here. Uh, prompt. There's my get win event XML. Here's my function I just declared and ran. Uh, strict mode version. All this other 
jazz in here? I don't really ever recall running. Okay, keep that in mind. So, and let's take a look at the last uh, 50 events instead. That'll be a little more interesting. So now, eh, let's take a look and see if there's anything recognizable in here. Get win event, prompt, set strict mode, prompt. You see prompt a lot. And I didn't have to type any of that jazz. All right. So let's keep keep moving then. So let's just grab everything then. What I'm looking for now, I always like out grid view. It makes things so much easier to read. So this is showing me then the machine name, the user ID, the time it was created, and then what actually, what was the script block that was executed at that time by that person on this machine. And we can see there's the get win events and things that I ran. But let's do this. Let's make this a little more interesting. I'm going to run over here to a separate console window. And I'm going to do this. Catch me if you can. All right. So I just ran that. Now, somewhere in the logs, we should find the string catch me if you can. All right. let's, anybody see that movie? Yes. Yep. Oh, look at there. Right there. Nice. There it is. Catch me if you can. I typed that at the console window and it got it. It hit the event logs. So all I'm doing there is looking for um, get win event, providing it the filter, those crazy filter syntaxes you really have to learn and pay your dues and study all those crazy event syntaxes, right? So I've done that, and so I'm just looking for event 4104, and then I'm passing it out there to some other things. Now, what if I want to find a certain command? Uh, so let's say I run get process. Uh, I know somebody ran a see what we've done in the first part here was say I just want to see all the commands that were run but what if I'm looking for a specific command now, I'm sure there's a, a more clever way to implement this in the filter syntax but what I did was I just said hey let's grab everything and say where the script block text is like star get process star I just want to go find all the events where somebody ran get process and I'm filtering out not like company name because that's some just some noise that comes up in the logs frequently. And look at there, right there it is. Uh, execute the command get process at 3.32 p.m. My VM's on a different time zone there. But there it is. It shows me the name, the machine, all that. It's good. Found it. It's in the logs. Now, what I did was, this was kind of painful. I sat down the other night and I created this little log noise variable that has like all kinds of random strings that appear in the stuff that PowerShell runs in the background that's not really the stuff I typed and I want to filter that junk out so I can just now give me a list of what shows up in the event logs that people have typed and run on this machine and filter out the noise all right so let's that's really what we're after in a forensic scenario is what did they really type don't show me all the junk that PowerShell is doing in the background so now when I take a look at that, I can see, uh, yes, I just ran the log noise command. And there's get process, there's the get win event when I declared that function, there's catch me if you can. And then there's this zero thing. The zero thing shows up a lot. It's a byproduct of the transcription when we turn that on. So here's the other half of this. We've got the module logging we looked at with DNS client. This is the everything logging that's new. Now let's, t in the event logs, now let's go flip over and look at the text file event log. So what I did on my domain controller was I deployed a logon script that looks like this. It says if the PS transcript path does not exist, go ahead and create it. And then I, I'm going to get a list of files in there older than 14 days and delete them. That's to keep it from driving my backup people crazy. So I don't have a thousand files in there. And I'm going to remove those items 
And then uh, later we're going to talk about invoke GPO update. There's a little hack, uh, a couple different ways to put in that firewall rule. So essentially I've created a PS transcript folder on my machine. So now I go look in on the C drive here and I've got this C PS transcripts and here's this folder full of transcripts and you can see by the file sizes some of these are kind of juicy there's some interesting things in there so let's open this one and see what we get I'm gonna go ratchet up the font size real quick so here's a text file that shows me everything that's been run on the machine see the zero at the very top I don't know why it is it looks like every time it starts a transcript it throws a zero in there to get things started I don't know. Somebody thought they needed to do that, I guess. So now let's scroll through here and see, because again, this is logging everything that's happening in the engine, not just what I type. So we want to find something that looks more interesting in here. Let's see, can we find catch me if you can? It's not in there. Hmm. Should be. Let's see, get process. Is it in there? Yeah, there's get process, there's get win event. All right. Um, you know what? Maybe it's in this other one right here. Oh, <gasps> there it is. Catch me if you can. Because this was a different session, okay? I had a session for the ISE. This is the transcript for the session I spun <coughs> up in the console that was separate. So there it is in black and white in a text log file that I can consume in any other product that digests text files. So I've now got it logged in two places. It's in the event log and it's in a text file. So I'm, now I'm really tracking everything happening on my machine. And that's a courtesy of KB 3850. Uh, in regards to the <coughs> excuse me, transcript files, other mm -hmm. than the actual script that was run, uh, whatever other information do you have? I mean, how do you, how do you link that to the user? It seems like the login information is far more useful than the transcript mm -hmm. data. Yeah. Um, so how do I tie that back to the user? Um, yesterday Lee said that you could look at the W, the WinRM log. That's Windows Remote Management. It's spelled out. And I was going through this some um, last night, uh, trying to look to find a connection. And honestly, I'm going to have to ask Lee because what I could find, well, in here. Uh, with the WinRM stuff, if I were to do a WinRM session, you'd be able to see. Let me find a good example here. Yeah, you'd you'd probably need to see that with remoting, but there's a run space as well. And what I want to show you in the 4105 event and the 4106 is that it shows you right here. Uh, the run space ID. There's an invocation script block ID and then a run space ID. And that's when you turn on the policy, you have to flip the additional check box to track this as well. So that gives me a run space ID that I can then correlate to the WinRM logs. I'm just not sure. I wasn't able to see where that tied in with the user ID, but that's what Lee says it works. So I'm going to snag him at lunch and say, hey, show me how this really works because I want to find that too. Just out of yeah. curiosity, if you if you have transcripting enabled to like a uh, centralized server, would that perhaps initiate a WinRM connection, or is it using some other handle? That's probably going to be SMB. I don't, don't think that'd be WinRM. All right, so I've got a few other things to, to tie up here. Uh, other things that that was the biggest piece I wanted to make sure we covered. The other thing is login scripts. How many are running PowerShell login scripts? Okay. Um, you can run PowerShell login scripts, uh, Windows 7 and above, it's supported. Just make sure you put it on the right tab. It'll never run if you put it on the first tab. So there's a second tab that says PowerShell scripts, and that's where they go. Is it hidden? Or is it no, it's, it's there. It's so just... Not in the sea of box. Oh, is the script hidden? Yeah, they're, they're not going to see a pop-up. It's, it's just kind of in the background. Oh, then never mind. We called ours the bad originally because of okay. how we had certain things set up inside of that. Yeah. So that's why we see it. So I was about to say, we do see it, but it's because we call it bad first. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You put it in a batch file. So you can specify the path to the script, obviously on a share, typically. 
Um, you can specify the order of execution by bumping up and down the list, and then you've got this little thing here about you know who gets the you know rock scissors paper, who's going to run first, the VB scripts or the PowerShell scripts, and you can tell them to run the Windows PowerShell scripts first or last. If you put it in the script path on the user object, would it display as opposed to the view policy? I've not tried that. I have not. The question was, could you put it in the user script path on the user object? I don't know. I tried that. I'm not going to take the time to, to demo that one uh, because it is it is running uh, in the we did see there briefly uh, in the script what I was doing was just creating a log file path and then cleaning it up. There's obviously a lot of things you could secure the folder, do other things with it there. I'm also creating a little firewall rule that will allow me to run this next command, invoke GP update. If you've not seen this invoke GP update, this is really uh, really clever. Uh, remoting, we did. How many have done the remoting? Or the policy to turn on remoting all over? Because that's that's just a good thing. How many of you though had a big battle with your security folks before you could turn that on? All right, yeah, okay. So that's typically the story. The, however, you just tell them, hey, look, in 2012 and above, it's already enabled anyway. We're just you know being compliant with the rest of everything that Microsoft's doing. So. Oh, no, no, that was the worst thing I told them. Yeah? It's enabled on what by default? Yeah. Shut it down. Yeah. Shut it down. Yeah. yeah. That, that was... we, we gracefully didn't tell them that. Yeah. We left that one behind. Yeah. They don't like this locking thing, though. So here's the thing. There's a partial procedure in the about remote troubleshooting uh, help file. And I'm kind of running short on time here. I'm just going to kind of speed through this real quick. So there's a listener. The thing to note is that in 2012, they changed the name of the policy item. So if you're following the guidance in the about topic, it was written for 2012, 2008R2. And then you go to look for automatic configuration of listeners, and it's not there. It's actually called allow remote server management through WinRM, which makes a lot more sense. Is it just changed when you update the ADMs? Or? I'm not sure where that what actually triggers it. Yeah. And it might be when it puts those out there. So then you got to open up the firewall and you got to uh, set the WinRM listener on there. So the listener, uh, I'm just going to kind of go through these slides real quick so we can get to the actual uh, policy. This is kind of the tricky part, but it does coax you through this in the help file, so you just know what to copy and paste in there and you can always uh, I wouldn't put it on a different port but you know you could tweak some things in there allowing only certain connections to connect on one around things like that make sure the service is started automatically these are all the things that enable when our, enable uh, PS <coughs> remoting does anyway so I want to get to the invoke GPO update though because we're running out of time so invoke GP update is your uh, help desk lifesaver so they can actually your help desk can now uh, refresh a policy on somebody's machine remotely without walking them through the whole thing over the phone. All right, so you can do this GP update, and now uh, this is kind of this one does have a pop up, and that's what I want to show you. Uh, if I do an invoke GPO update or GP update right here, I'm going to run this, uh, and it does target Win7 machines. I'm going to specify random delay in minutes at zero to force it to run immediately. So I want you to watch what happens when I do this. I'm going to flip over to my VM real quick. And there it goes. See that black window pop up? Updating policy from taskengine.exe. That's going to freak somebody out. Is that, now, is that update user and computer <coughs> policy? Local logged on user and computer policy? Yeah, let's take a look at the command real quick. Let me make sure I get back to the right window here. So. If you take a look at uh, invoke GPO, invoke GP update, here's your parameters as job, boot, computer, force, log off, yeah. target, sync. So what it looks like it'll do just, I don't see a user switch on there. Well, I would, I would say by default, that's probably what it does. it's running under user at least because yeah. it's showing the user. Oh, that's the, compu that's the computer name parameter, I'm sorry. Okay. They didn't write that one very well to spec either. So uh, here's the thing, you can force a log off and a reboot. So boot or log off will actually force the computer 
to log off so they can rerun the login script or to reboot so they can rerun the startup script and other policies that require a log off or a reboot with uh, invoke GP update. Yeah. Is that, I mean, is, it, is that what that is or is that like the equivalent of like GP update force boot? Yeah, it's, it's basically the equivalent. Yeah, so it's, it's going to force it. Which doesn't always force a reboot. Okay. So I haven't had enough experience with this one in the wild. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, wrap things up here real quick. Okay, so those are, uh, what the reason I did this session is I wanted to just provide a, an overview for these kinds of things that it's kind of there in the background and we don't talk about it a lot. In the world of PowerShell, we're always talking about features and new bells and whistles and all this stuff, but this is kind of the everyday admin stuff. You just need to know if I've got PowerShell in the enterprise and I want to manage it appropriately, these are the features that are in the box to help you do that. So the big takeaways here are things that you want to remember. If you're going to turn on remoting in 2012, just look for the renamed new policy item there. Make sure you pull out uh, KB3850. If you want to go ahead and start leveraging this additional logging in your environment today, you can do that. You just have to roll that KB, that update to your machines. And then when you're tracking this stuff, the event logs, you're looking for 4103 through 4106. Those are your magic <coughs> events. However, um, I noticed as I was doing this, I was building these labs out in an Azure VM over a remote desktop session, right? So that's going to have a little bit of lag to it occasionally. But when you've got three layers of uh, you know, like transcription and two layers of event logging going on for every single command you type, there's going to be a little bit of a perf impact to that. So just be aware you don't want to kill your servers with too much transcription. Be selective about what you monitor. And then also that little invoke GP update thing, if you try to run it against a machine and it's not set up to do it, it'll pop up and tell you in some red text, hey, you need to turn on this firewall rule first for remote scheduled task management. And you can set that either through policy or through that little netsh command I had in the login script. There's a couple different ways to do that there. One other thing I, I kind of glanced over was if you choose to use PowerShell for login scripts, uh, one of my peers is a perf expert and he was on site with a company and they were complaining about boot times, log on times, and one of the things they noticed was they had a bunch of PowerShell login scripts. And the thing you have to remember is that when it builds that instance of PowerShell, it's loading .NET to do that. So in the logon process for your logon script that's running PowerShell, it's actually firing up the whole .NET framework to support the blue window that nobody can see back there executing the script. So there's a little bit of a perf hit for that. Just be aware of that as you're deploying these things. And save, save the, the big fancy stuff for your PowerShell logins and scripts. Don't go crazy with them, all right? Okay, uh, that is the overview of group policy and PowerShell. Uh, thank you for being patient and hanging around. Went over a few minutes. I'm gonna hit the big red button, but I've got a sticker to give away. All right, hit the button. <laughs>